Prince Street is brought to you by Dean and DeLuca, purveyors of the finest food since 1977. With over 40 stores around the world, Dean and DeLuca curates the best ingredients for life. The whole family is coming over to barbecue, so what do I need? Hot dogs? Burgers? Xanax? I'm always thinking, this should be easy. It's summer. I know these people. They're not the royal family. They're my family. I should just throw it all on the grill, toss beers in a bucket, maybe some wine. Keep it mellow. The problem is, I always need to outdo me. And that's when it gets hard. I get worried about what kind of burger beef. Brisket? Chuck? Or is it better burgers come from Chuck and short rib? And oh, do I worry over the side dishes. Corn, grilled or boiled? I'm a mess, but it feels good. Thanks for not judging. You're helping already. Welcome to Prince Street. I'm Howie Kahn. On this episode, our focus is anxiety. It's August, summer's in full swing, and there's a lot of talk about ice cream and the beach. But I've been listening to everyone, everywhere, and people are on edge. Writers, chefs, comedians, politicians, voters. This month on Prince Street, Kat Kinsman, Jay McInerney, Eric Ramirez, Jessica Coslow, and Phil Rosenthal. They're coping, dealing, making jokes, and making progress, all in surprising ways. Stick around for their stories. Oh, jeez. Talk about anxiety. That's Phil Rosenthal. Wouldn't we all be happier if the airlines just perfected a great turkey sandwich? You would almost look forward to, oh, I'm flying today. Instead of trying to make beef bourguignon and it's dog food, make something that we all know, that we like. Somewhere in America, someone has decided that the illusion of something nice is better than something nice. I recently met up with Phil, the Queens-born creator of the 69-time Emmy-nominated sitcom Everybody Loves Raymond, and the host of a new show, I'll Have What Phil's Having, which chronicles his food fantasies. I was wondering about the connection between food, comedy, and anxiety. Phil turned out to be the perfect resource. We are in the most non-anxious place I've maybe ever been, sweeping views of uh, everything, the Hudson River, Central Park, atop the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in New York City. And uh, somewhere out there is uh, Phil's childhood home, where he learned to be afraid of food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cooking was not my mom's strong point, but she was great in every other way. And I always kid them that... Uh, you can't blame them for being terrible parents. It wasn't their field. Yeah. Yes. They didn't interview for the job. Right. Take me to dinner at your, your childhood table. Oh, geez. Talk about anxiety. In our house, meat was a punishment. And that, I'm not really kidding about that. Because there was a cuisine, the style, and it was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> she would get the, the cheapest cut of meat, whatever was on sale, which meant the toughest cut of meat. Then it would be cooked within an inch of its life, gray. I used to joke that she had a setting on the oven for shoe. It would, it would, it would hurt to chew. And I wasn't allowed to leave the table until I finished. Oh, man. So it did feel like a punishment. And uh, I remember stuffing my cheeks with the meat and, and then going and spitting it out and pretending I was done. Now, cut to years later, and I'm here in New York, I'm working downtown, and... Somebody says, hey, the boss is uh, going to take us to dinner tonight. Oh, really? Where are we going? We're going to a steakhouse. And I'm like, steakhouse? No, thanks. I'm not going. What do you mean? It's great. It's Gallagher's. And I said, why would anyone want steak? And they said, you're an idiot. Just come along. Get something else. And I come, and the steak comes to the table. And I look at it, and I go, what's that? And they said, that's steak. And try it. Okay. And I take a bite of this. It's charred on the outside. It's rare on the inside. It's friggin' delicious. And I literally asked if that was steak. And then I went home and slapped my mother. (laughs) 
Did she slap you back? Always. Using a piece of meat as a weapon? Yes, right. So there were revelations like that when I left my parents' house. People asked me if I cook, and I can't. I don't. And they said, but you're so into food, you should know how to cook. I said, no, I don't. I'm a fan. There's plenty of great chefs in the world that can't write a sitcom. We, co- we all contribute in our own way. Early on, because you had these traumatic food experiences in, yeah. your, in your childhood, was food able to get into your writing in a comical way? Because all this is, is funny and makes for a good joke. I think food is so relatable, right? So it was a big part of Everybody Loves Raymond, mm-hmm. you know, that the mom was a fantastic cook, and that's actually how she held sway over the family. And that the joke was that he married a terrible cook, right? His Deborah was a terrible cook, and so she that was that was kind of the the battleground. We did several episodes about this very thing, and food was a part of every episode, also as a, a as this beautiful unifier in the family, the family meals. Right, the very last shot of the show was there, all crowded around the breakfast table. I think the number one most important element to having a success in, in a show is the food, the catering of the show. When you're on a show and the show is doing well, there's pretty much nothing they won't give you if you ask for it. And <laughs> for me, I thought this was a way to form a family. Because if you go to craft service table and it's just chips and nuts and bullshit and you're just like grabbing it to sustain yourself or because you're bored and going on with your day... But if there's beautiful stuff there, like I'm talking about special stuff, like once in a while deli flown in from New York, Mm -hmm. or cinnamon buns from Ann Sather's in Chicago, or somebody's making fresh tacos backstage. It's just like an incredible food fair when you come to the set and people are excited. So it's this shortcut to friendship. And family. Right. So you think you'll get a better performance out of Ray Romano the night the, the ribs come in from, from Memphis. Funny comes from happy. You have a show called I'll Have What Phil's Having. Yes. And it takes you around the world into some amazing places. It's the complete opposite of your childhood. It's about food as a gift and a treasure and something that, as you say, makes everybody so, so immensely happy. The very first line in the show, the teaser, you're standing in the Takashimaya department store in Tokyo. Yeah. And you're looking around at all this beautiful stuff, all these amazing offerings. And you say to the camera... I have so much anxiety. I don't yeah. know how I'm going to choose. Yes, the Takashimaya is the biggest food hall you've ever seen. It's unbelievable. If you buy a stick of gum, they wrap it for you as if it's for your 100th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but there is that anxiety. You know, I, I travel a, a fair amount. I do have that that sort of jittery feeling. I go, God, what if I miss something? And I find myself sometimes having maybe a second dinner. Or maybe, oh, really? Or maybe a third dinner. They call that a, a bang bang. The bang bang? Have you heard of that? No. I think Louis C.K. might have created that term. You have a dinner, a full dinner, and then you go have another one. <laughs> one of the things that I, I've discussed with you before is that you're a, a consummate entertainer and you have, have people over and you make pizza for that. Yes, it's uh, movie night. I've been doing movie night since I'm 15 years old. And uh, I would have my junior high school friends over to watch an R-rated movie this new thing called HBO. This, to me, was like mind-boggling. And every Saturday night was a new movie. And we might see boobies. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever it is, we didn't care. (laughs) And ordering a pizza. So now this has evolved over the years. Through college, I ran the program board films thing just so I could see the movies I wanted to see at school shown on a big screen. And there was concessions. After college, now I move into New York. I'm a struggling actor in New York, but I have an apartment and I have a TV and I have a new thing called a VCR. And so now I can pick the movies that I want and ordering in pizza. And then I move to Hollywood. The TV gets a little bigger with with a job. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) And then I become a writer and then the TV gets a little bigger and a little bigger until now I have a dedicated kind of screening room and the pizza is made in the wood-burning oven in the kitchen i gotta tell you the first night that all that came together the culmination of the dream of the 
the pizza oven, the movie theater, basically, I kind of got emotional. This is a dream for me. It is is a dream for me. This is what I think means you've made it in life. If you have a wood-burning pizza oven. This is a special edition of today on anxiety for assholes who have nothing (laughs) really to worry about. We did 210 episodes of that show. That's unbelievable. Every single episode at some point, whether it was during the writing of the episode, the filming of the episode, or the editing of that episode... I thought, and I'm t- telling you every single time, this is the one we didn't get, where we didn't get it. And I had that anxiety. I believe it. It's a negative feeling. Mm-hmm. I wish I didn't go through this. There's something wrong with me, maybe. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, maybe this worry, this anxiety, maybe that in and of itself produces, helps you produce good work. Maybe if we were all worried about more things, more things would be better. Phil's show, I'll have what Phil's having available on Netflix yes. and uh, winner of a James Beard Award. So How about that? Phil. Look at me with the medal around my neck like I'm an Olympian. He's wearing it right now. He <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs>
So I put a survey online where you could go to chefswithissues.com and I asked people specifically, what are the issues you're dealing with? How much help are you getting for them? How free are you to talk about it at work? Some trends were very, very clear to me. Depression and anxiety are suffered by a vast majority of people in the industry. People are self-medicating like crazy. I asked, do you feel free to disclose to anybody at work about this, especially upper management? And the vast majority of people said no. And the reason was they didn't want to be thought of as weak or thought of is crazy. You know, it's it's tough. The way that restaurants goers can completely trash a restaurant's reputation through one tweet, one Instagram, one bad Yelp review. So the pressure is on. Um, everything has to be absolutely perfect or you might lose your job. People maybe sometimes lose their grace, you know, when their reputation is at stake. You know, to have your, your worth brought down to a plate, I think that would be really difficult for anybody. The mental health issue is not as straightforward. We're not as comfortable talking talking about mental health as a medical issue. Yeah, it's awkward. You know, I tell chefs, this has to start with them. If they can possibly say to their staff, like, hey, when I was in therapy, that they can let people who work for them know that it's it's okay if they're having issues, they can talk with them. And I keep telling them, look, it's going to be super awkward when your line cook starts crying in front of you. But, you know, they're under a huge amount of stress. They're not taking care of themselves physically because they can't emotionally. I don't know. There are all sorts of different aspects of, of kitchen life that make this incredibly pressure filled. And I think it's easy to translate that into, hey, hey, if you can't put up with this, you're a wuss, you shouldn't be in the kitchen. There is this machismo in kitchens. It's rampant, Gordon Ramsay screaming, like, you know, we kind of make jokes about it, but there is a truth to it. Are chefs under any more pressure than athletes, banking, Hollywood agents? I mean, there's a ton of high pressure jobs that would engender the same level of anxiety in the people who are doing them. Everything you just mentioned is high paid. These people don't have money. That's interesting. People are paid crap in this position. They don't have health insurance. You don't have the money to go and see a, a therapist. You don't have the money to get your medication. You are scared to death about money. And that just exacerbates absolutely everything. That's a very good point. Do you think, though, that money would change things? Because the thing is, sleep is free. Taking a walk is free. But you have to have the time and luxury to be able to do that. I mean, restaurants are on razor thin margins and things have to happen at a certain pace and at a certain cost. But you also have to be able to, you know, leave there and have a day off where you can sleep, where you can, you know, step away for a moment, where you can, you know, have a little bit of money so you can go out to eat somewhere else. So you're not just relying on family meal. You have to be a whole person. And there is this sort of legendary machismo to the whole thing where these kids are coming in there and absolutely thinking that this is how it has to be. It's the only model that they have ever seen, where you go in there and you are just, as my old therapist used to say, a human doing, not a human being. You know, that that doesn't bode well for the future of the profession. So, of these 25 million Americans who are suffering from general anxiety disorder, many of them cook. And what if they're maybe nervous? What would you recommend for home cooks who are suffering from anxiety but who still want to enjoy the pleasures of a meal, the pleasures of a feast? Preparation is everything. Several days ahead of time, make lists for yourself. Count backwards time-wise what needs to be done when. The biggest trick that I picked up was pulling out the blue kitchen tape and taping up lists all over the kitchen. It was the recipes and method for everything. And we didn't have to go looking for it because it was right there in front of our face. And I've started doing that for parties. So I don't even have to think or worry. The day before, I try to get as much done as possible. I pre-batch cocktails, which is a really, really great thing. If you're still cooking, you can invite them to come into your kitchen and you know have a drink while they talk to you. Um, that's what they're there for. They're there to spend time with you. And you'll be able to relax and enjoy yourself at your own party. And then here's the thing. Don't worry too much about dessert. Most of the fanciest people I know, they bust out cheese or chocolate. I know plenty of people who just, they might put out a few containers of, you know, ice cream or gelato or whatever, a few toppings if they feel like it, whip some cream, you know, put out, you know, a few, a few other little things. But don't fuss over being, like, perfect is the the enemy of calm. Yeah. Like, really. Um, if you give yourself permission to not be perfect, God, you'll be so much happier. Kat Kinsman's memoir, High Anxiety, Life with a Bad Case of Nerves, will be out in November.
Now it's time for Eden Eats NYC with Eden Grinchpan. I'm here today with Chef Eric Ramirez, the executive chef and owner of the Llama Inn. The location is actually in the heart of Williamsburg, and the space is just, you know, simply gorgeous. I'm so excited to be here with you today to talk about your food and your story. So thank thank you for having me. Ah, Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. You know, you've been in the game for a long time, right? Yeah, I've been cooking for a while. How long have you been in New York City? Ten years. And where are you from originally? I grew up right outside the city in Jersey. Mm. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your journey? You know, you have worked in kitchens for a really long time. You were the Sioux at 11 Madison Park. You've also worked at Nuella and Ramey. And now you're here. And this is your first restaurant that you're opening, yes? Yeah. How long have you been cooking Peruvian food? Is, has that always been a passion of yours? Actually, mm, not, not, not really. I never really thought that I was going to cook the food that I grew up eating. You know, like when I first started cooking, I started in um, American French was uh, was what I wanted to do. You know, mm-hmm. I never really looked at Peruvian food as, as that. You know, mm-hmm. it was kind of very like peasant, very like, you know, just very <laughs> like something that you were just kind of used to, obviously, yeah. too, because you grew up eating it. Yeah. So it's, it wasn't what I thought that I was going to cook. Yeah. And when did that change for you? Um, so I took a trip to Peru, maybe 2008, 2009. And that really kind of just changed my whole outlook of what Peruvian cuisine was, you know. It, it's evolved so much and, you know, what the chefs were doing over there was pretty amazing and, and a lot of, like, uh, ingredients that I've never tasted and never had and I really thought, like, we have to bring what they're doing over there here. It's not like the criolla anymore, right? The criolla is like the, the local city food that you find typically everywhere in Peru, right? And uh, that's the food that I grew up eating, so I never really thought of cooking that. But then once I saw what they were doing over there and I was like, this... This has potential and it's delicious and it's the ingredients are like things you've never had. I was like, this is this is what I'm gonna have to do. You wanted it to be your story to bring Peruvian food, contemporary Peruvian food, to New York City. I guess now it's like become the Llama Inn story, mm-hmm. but it was never really my intention. You know, it was more of just like giving it a different perspective, making people look at Peruvian cuisine in a, in a different in a different way. You know, it has a lot more to offer. I think Peruvian food is a cuisine, you know, it's having its moment right now. And I think a lot of people are really intrigued by it. You are really showcasing a new Peruvian cuisine to people. I looked at uh, your menu and there's dashi in there. And, you know, there's there is a lot of Japanese and Chinese influence in your cuisine and European as well. So why don't you tell me a little bit what Peruvian food is, you know, to you? You have all these cultural influences. You have the Chinese, the Japanese the African, the Spanish, the indigenous, German, Italian, you know, and then you have all these, like all this biodiversity, right? A lot of microclimates. Um, you have the coast, the Sierra, which uh, the Andes, um, the Amazon, then the desert. So you have all these crazy ingredients that grow everywhere in Peru. That's what really makes Peruvian cuisine. It's very ingredient driven. That's what makes it special. And that's mm-hmm. like the whole, the whole thing here to kind of make it as special as as we possibly can. Well, you're doing that. You take the classic dishes and you obviously kind of, you give it your spin. Yeah. It's the Eric spin. The Eric spin. It's special. It's unique. And I think you're opening up people's eyes to what Peruvian food can be, can potentially can be, be. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and is now. Yeah. So the theme of this podcast is anxiety. That's a pretty good theme. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why is anxiety a good theme? I mean, probably not only for me, but, you know, like uh, for a lot of chefs, we go through a lot of anxiety. I mean, I do personally, right? It's just, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of part of the job. Yeah, it's kind of part <laughs> of the job. Yeah, it just, it's just, it's a little stressful sometimes. That's why when you said anxiety, I'm like, great, because I was just talking about this to my girlfriend a couple of days ago. I was like, how do I get rid of this anxiety sometimes? Because it's just a little. Lots of sex. Yeah. <laughs> or jogging. Yoga's good too. Is there any anxiety that comes from opening up a Peruvian restaurant for you? For me, it's just staying fresh. That brings anxiety sometimes. Now, like every dish that I approach, I'm like, is it, is it interesting? Is it, does it have the flavor profile that represents llama in does it does it have like these great textures that i like playing with everything has to be approached in a different light now and that kind of sometimes brings a little anxiety i think that if you just put your heart on the plate which you have been doing everyone's just going to continue to love being here and love your food Okay, so ceviche. We're going to be making ceviche today. Correct. Obviously, that is a very classic Peruvian dish. 
Why did you choose ceviche to make with me? Because I feel like it's uh, it's the national dish of Peru. So if if you ask any Peruvian what their favorite dish is, they'll probably usually say ceviche. It's just it's like it's it, just good. It just represents you know Peruvian cuisine. I think we're gonna get to it. Yeah. I am so excited to get in the kitchen with you. Awesome. I cannot wait for you to show me all your tricks and tips on how to make the perfect ceviche. Let me grab my apron. And then we're gonna start cooking. Yeah. To watch Eden and Eric make ceviche and to get the recipe, go to livefromprintstreet.com. Next up, our senior correspondent, Sierra Tishgart, has a great story for us. There's something to the saying, do one thing and do it well. But what do you do after you've done that one thing well? Jessica Coslo, the chef owner of Squirrel, named because it combines girl with squirrel away, is busy answering this question. I'm Sierra. I met up with her during one of her recent trips to New York to talk about all of her big plans for her restaurants and all of her anxiety about said plans. How fun. I didn't know how much in the shits I was until I was actually in it. Let me tell you a little bit about Jessica. Beyond being one of my closest friends, she's a woman who made Los Angeles gaga for jam and flavors like Seascape Strawberry and Rose Germania. Jessica was raised by a single mom who expected her to follow a more corporate career path. But Jessica had a love for cooking that she just couldn't shake. She started picking up night shifts at a local bakery, and then one day she discovered a cheap, tiny space to make and sell her jam. She started a small jam shop in 2011 in Silver Lake. That same jam now goes atop toast, her signature dish. It's inch and a half thick brioche, piled high with both seasonal jam and fresh ricotta. There's so much demand for her food that she's releasing a cookbook titled Everything I Want to Eat, with recipes for dishes like her sorrel pesto rice bowl and butternut squash latkes. And within a couple years, the space blew up into a destination breakfast and lunch spot. So I asked her, how did she manage all that? I think when we're in our 20s, uh, we're able to like take it all. We're able to be like, I don't need to sleep. I'm going to bake bread from midnight to 8 a.m. and sleep for two hours and then go work at the office. It became very clear that it was exhausting, that I couldn't keep it up. Um, and transitioning into food full time was something that had to be my reality. And why was it jam to start? Jam to start because it was something I could do myself. For Squirrel, we're investorless. I took all the money that I made and put it into the Squirrel and then have continued to basically develop it with, you know, my own funds. So, you know, unfortunately I couldn't have a, like I had to start with just me. I think like I'm 35, but maybe like five on the inside. And so a lot of a lot of the dishes on the menu reflect this kind of nostalgia of of one what I, you know, grew up with. And well, jam is what we started with and toast and jam seems like the nice, you know, next step. How did that feel to invest all of your money into this? Terrifying. <laughs> I remember you said your mom said, What the hell are you doing? Oh yeah, that's true. I want to say that she doesn't have those questions or fears anymore, which is really wonderful. But at the time, it was a, it did feel terrifying, you know, to have, to go from something that was very stable to something that was very unstable. So as Squirrel evolves, it becomes insanely popular. Lines down the block. How's it feel to walk up to the restaurant and see this kind of massive crowd consistently? <laughs> On the one hand, it's, I mean, it's such a great feat because so many chefs are just like opening their doors, asking people to come in. On the other hand, it can be really stressful because the expectation, I feel the pressure because they're standing in line. Are you worth it? Do you ever feel like people aren't realizing the full picture or do you feel pigeonholed as, oh, this is a breakfast spot? I mean, the idea I think behind Squirrel is that it's food that, transcends all hours of the day and but f because it starts with breakfast we've gotten pigeonholed a little bit into that category but that's okay because that's what that's what squirrel is we're a breakfast and lunch place and to own that is really important you know I think once you own what you are 
that anxiety or that kind of fear of missing out kind of leaves because you're accepting like this is this is what squirrel is and it's honest and you're now at the point where I feel you can expand and physically take over more spaces on the block because you're kind of bursting out of squirrel how did you get to that point were you able to financially support yourself doing this we looked at squirrel and we said look if we don't have next door that has a prep kitchen and a walk-in we can't make squirrel viable and because I don't have any investors, I don't have to snap. I snap at my own whim, which also means sometimes like Squirrel Away should probably be open right now, but it's taking its time to get open. Um, and that's its own anxiety. The pressure of like, when is, when's your next door opening? How's that going? And you're like, it's, it's going, guys. Like, there's a lot going on and it's going. So how do I integrate a new restaurant into my life in a way that makes sense? and stays honest and has integrity without running myself dry, I think, you know, has been a big question for me. Jessica also serves roasted lamb sandwiches and vegan brown rice porridge, which makes her food kind of hard to define. Really, both she and her restaurant are outliers. Jessica's actually working on an entirely new concept, the yet-to-be-named restaurant will be located in the Sawtell neighborhood in Los Angeles. She's drawing from her Jewish heritage while crafting the menu. Imagine Zahav, Shia, Russ, and Daughters, but with a youthful California vibe, supplied by sustainable drought-resistant produce from her own farm. I'm trying not to have anxiety about it. Like, you know, it's one of those things, like, you know it's in the future. It was just like doing the cookbook. Can I swear on this? Like, I... I didn't know how much in the shits I was until I was actually in it, you know? And that's kind of, and that's also the thing. When I opened Squirrel, I didn't know how hard it was going to be until I did it. And so it's kind of nice to have these like horse blinders on, just like full steam ahead. I'm charging for it. I know this is what I'm doing. Because if I took those blinders off, I'd probably be terrified. I'd probably see that I was on top of a cliff and like the only way was to like jump down. This woman got Los Angeles excited about toast. I think she'll land on her feet. Jessica Koslow's first book, Everything I Want to Eat, hits stands October 4th. On this episode, Jay McInerney reads an excerpt from his new novel, his ninth, Bright Precious Days, just published this week. But first, guest contributor and the executive editor at Reagan Arts, Lucas Whitman, sat down with Jay to continue the conversation they started in the summer issue of the Paris Review. Lucas discovers what Jay secretly has in common with his protagonist and alter ego, Russell Calloway, and how anxiety is defined in a world of Grand Cru Burgundy and First Growth Bordeaux. From your first novel in the trilogy, Brightness Falls, up into Bright Precious Days, now there's been a huge change in the food culture in this city, and you've written yeah. about that. Well, you know, when I arrived in New York City, which is pretty much when Russell arrived in New York City in late 79, 1980. Um, mm. Fine dining was, you know, there were these old school French restaurants like Lutasse and uh, La Grande Nuit. Um, but we we didn't know that much about food. We didn't care that much about food. You know, we were, we were drinking absolute vodka and snorting a lot of cocaine. You know, I have a, I, um, you know, I have a friend who came to the to New York from the Midwest, who was a waitress at Indochine, and she couldn't understand why we ordered all this food and didn't eat it. <laughs> it was because we were really high. <laughs> but eventually, um, you know, but I, I guess I watched it develop, and I, I, I guess I, I became a part of it. Do you and, remember and, the moment and, when you realized it was becoming a thing in the city? I was at the Miami Book Fair in the mid to late 90s. It's probably about 97 or 8. And I met Mar Mario Batali, who was down there promoting his first cookbook. And Mario was very sweet and deferential. And he said, wow, he said, I can't believe I get to meet the author of Bright Lights Big City. And he said, you know, you're, you're a star. Or say something. And, <laughs> and immediately, he was besieged by fans and autograph seekers who, who didn't apparently recognize me. And we, 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 <laughs> we uh, you know, we, we spent a good part of the night together. And I realized that this guy, this, this chef was way more famous than I was. <laughs> it was. It was an interesting moment. Yeah. 
You know, I, I think I, I really got into wine, you know, as, as I was around the time that I was writing and publishing my first book. And uh, I, worked at a, I worked at a liquor store. And I, um, this I used, was in, in Syracuse. And, in Syracuse, New York, when yeah. I was stu- studying with Raymond Carver and uh, Tobias Wolf. And, and I used to take home a bottle or two every night and uh, sample it. Um, that, that was the tradition among the clerks since we were paid minimum wage. Uh, you know, I take home a bottle of Yugoslavian Chardonnay. That tells you how long ago this was <laughs> because there was a Yugoslavia then. And, um, and, you know, I gradually worked my way up to the sort of $6 Spanish cava, you know, like Frejene, which is still out there. And, you know, I, I kind of I've kind of developed a palate by starting mm. at the bottom. And, uh, and, and when Bright Lights uh, was published and – uh, began to sell very well. I was I was able to um, I was able to improve my <laughs> my drinking, and I was able to move move up the the food or the wine chain, as it were. Um, it, I, it gave me a way to intellectualize my hedonism. You know, um, <laughs> uh, eventually, you know, there's not much, that much to be learned from cocaine and vodka, whereas <laughs> wine is a kind of an endless subject. Do you have a particular memory of like that first wine moment of of when you were beginning to drink more serious stuff? And... Uh, I met the novelist Julian Barnes. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had the same publisher at that time. And subsequently, I became good friends with, with Julian. And our friendship happened to uh, coincide with the, the invention of the fax machine. So we started, <laughs> <laughs> but we started faxing each other wine notes. And uh, when you go to Julian's house, you have to taste blind, which is... Every, sort of annoying. Yeah, you have to sing for your supper, you know. And, and, and of course, this can lead to terrible humiliations. <laughs> uh, like you say, like, you say something like, well, it can't be La Mission O'Brien. And then he, like, unveils the bottle and it's La Mission O'Brien. And you're the fool. <laughs> yeah. And you're, so I'm, I'm just singing like, God, am I going to screw this up? Or <laughs> am I going to look like I don't know anything about wine? You know, at this point, I write about it, so I should know you something. You get paid to write about, about it. You've got to know something. How do you approach wine writing versus your fiction writing? I mean, it seems that there's some – one of the things I love about your, your wine columns is that there's always a sense of character and a sense of, of plot, too. There's a sense of you're, you're going somewhere, you're discovering something new, or you're meeting some someone. Yeah, well, I, I think of necessity. I – Ten, I, I wrote about wine like a novelist. Right. <laughs> I, I, it quickly, quickly occurred to me as I was you know, thinking of ways to describe wine and the taste of it and the experience of drinking it that, that metaphor and simile were more useful than sort of these literal f- flavor descriptions. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you can say – you can say, as I tried to do in one of my early columns, that a California Chardonnay is very tropical and buttery and rich and oaky – and that a, a, that a Chablis is very lean and minerally and flinty and flinty and thin and or or you could compare one to Kate Moss and the other to Pamela <laughs> Anderson who were then current figures yes. and and people would get it much quicker I think. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, we're all um, very curious to know what you're what are you drinking and loving right now. Champagne is always uh, my go-to. Uh, it's always my first drink of the night mm-hmm. Some, and sometimes my last. You know, I think people make a terrible mistake when they view champagne as a, something to be had on rare um, special ce- occasions. celebratory occasions mm-hmm. and holidays because it's the most versatile food wine out there. Uh, and the best thing that's happening in, in the world of champagne is, is the grower champagne movement. All these, you know, all of the champagnes that used to come to this country were made by you know, giant corporations and in giant blending vats, uh, they would buy buy from the growers and dump their grapes, all, crush their grapes all together, and make a kind of a consistent and generic product. But now, uh, a lot of these people that used to sell to the champagne houses are are making their own wines, bottling under their own labels, uh, making individual styles from individual pieces of of ter- of. of individual vineyards in, in Champagne. And it's, it's, um, it's really exciting. Champagne is becoming a little more like Burgundy. So you've got a new novel coming out, Jay. Yeah. It's called uh, Bright Precious Days. And this sets up th- th- this couple and their um, love affairs and the challenges of life in New York set up this um, extraordinary novel about New York in, in, in our time. 
this couple, uh, Russell and Kareen Calloway, they're highly educated. Right. They're, they're Manhattan dwellers. They're, they're, they're good-looking uh, Ivy League graduates. Uh, I mean, R- Russell's a, he's a foodie. He's a wine guy. Can't always keep up with his friends, as, as we, yeah, as we yeah. see in this chapter. He's kind of desperate for a cash infusion, um, as, as most of the rest of the world is, mm-hmm. as, 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 as the economy melts down at the end of 2007. I'm going to read a, uh, an excerpt that takes place in a, in a restaurant, which I call Bacchus. Russell arrived 10 minutes early and took a seat at the bar. He'd read about the restaurant, Bacchus, the $200 prefix, the 100,000 bottle seller, the four layman bankers who'd run up a $72,000 tab, but hadn't ventured inside until Tom Raines suggested meeting there. So how's Corrine, he asked, after they'd ordered their food from the menu a polyglot document that blithely mixed French, Italian, and Asian terms under the banner of new American cuisine. The raw seafood was listed as crudo rather than sashimi, drizzled in olive oil rather than ponzu or soy sauce, whereas a fried seafood menly was called tempura rather than bolito misto, and at least half of the main courses were cooked sous vide, a high-tech method of slow boiling in plastic bags pioneered by the Trogro brothers in Rouen, France, which all the ambitious New York chefs had recently adopted for their own purposes. The psalm reappeared, bearing yet another fishbowl of red wine, which he placed atop a cocktail napkin in front of Tom. From the gentleman at the other table, he said. After swirling, sniffing, and sipping, he offered Russell a taste. It's amazing, Russell said. It is, said Tom. He lifted the cocktail napkin from the table and dabbed his lips with it. One of the Goldman Sachs boys detached himself from the group and sauntered over to the table, glass in hand. Tom made the introductions and exchanged information about golfing plans for the weekend. So what do you think it is, the man asked, nodding toward Tom's glass. I was almost tempted to say Massetto, Tom said, teasing out the conclusion. But on second thought, I think... It's 82 Petrus. The other man was crestfallen. You saw the bottle. How could I have seen the bottle when you had Don wrap a napkin around it? Indeed, Russell observed, the bottle on the table across the way was swathed in white linen. Impressive, Reigns, the man said. Well, I had it last month, Tom conceded with uncharacteristic modesty. How did you guess, Russell asked, after the banker had returned to his table. Tom seemed very pleased with himself. I know these guys. I knew after my wine, they'd have to try to top me. To do that, they'd have to order a first-growth Bordeaux from a great year. There are only eight first-growths, if you count the unofficial three on the right bank. And I know the wine list here. I know what's on offer. Petrus is very distinct from the others. It's the only first growth that's 100% Merlot. Still, Russell said, I'm impressed. As a matter of fact, I probably would have nailed it, Tom said, but I didn't leave it to chance. After glancing over at the Goldman Sachs table, he lifted up the cocktail napkin that the sommelier had placed under his glass, on which 82 Petrus was scribbled. I tip him much better than they do, Tom said. Plus, I'm an investor in this place. He seemed delighted to be able to share this secret. In life, in business, you need an edge. Information is power, Russell. You try not to leave anything to chance. I never make a trade unless I know more than the other guy knows. Over the course of the next two hours, the exigencies of his professional life seemed to fade under the influence of the food and the wine as they made their way through a seven-course tasting menu and several bottles of exceptional wine. His anxiety anesthetized until, near the end of dinner, he wondered whether he'd be expected to split the bill, which would undoubtedly be larger than any he'd ever seen in his life. What would Jay order next to show off to the Goldman Sachs guys? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, well. Look. Of course, it would. Uh, it's very simple. You know, the only, the only way to one up someone who buys you 
the greatest Bordeaux in the world is to is to buy Burgundy. <laughs> On the one hand, I take it seriously in the, in, in the sense that I that I love to learn, and I and I think it's worth learning, and I think drinking wine can be an aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't want to take it too seriously because it's just it's supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. But as a novelist, I find it's really it's 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 ripe for parody. Uh, <laughs> this this culture. <laughs> Bright Precious Days and the summer issue of the Paris Review are both on sale in bookstores now. Now it's time for our Madeleine moment, inspired by the French author Marcel Proust and a passage from his novel in which a character dips a cookie into his tea and is transported back to his childhood. Hi, this is Phil Rosenthal and this is my Madeleine moment. Whenever I have matzo ball soup, it's instantly transporting to my beautiful Uma, that's the German word for grandma, her tiny kitchen. She had a kitchen in Washington Heights. It was the size of a small closet. I mean, you couldn't fit a full-size refrigerator in it. And she was this little bent-over woman and her little shaky hands. She made everything herself. Now, matzahs are, you know, a terrible thing. They're cardboard. People shouldn't really eat them. Jews, though, they like the idea of punishing themselves for no reason. So it gives us something to complain about. No one takes the care and the time and devotion to doing it literally from scratch. She was a genius. Just a few carrots here and there, no meat. See, maybe a bit of dill in there as well. She turned these matzahs into these wonderful creatures in this delicious bowl of love. That's all for this month on Print Street. Please come back next month when we explore fullness with sweet bitter authors Stephanie Dandler, Matthew and Emily Highland of the restaurant Emily, and John Melkovich. 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 My name is Juliet, and if I were a food, I would be a strawberry because they're really juicy. Hello, my name's Olara, and I want to be a hot pepper because um, I can burn people's mouths. Print Street is produced by Elizabeth Robinson, Julian Plante, Rose Reed, Rob Corso, Caitlin Pierce, and executive produced by Charles Finch. I want to be a banana because my mum hates bananas. <laughs> if I was food, I'll be a pancake because they're very round and, and nice. Theme music by Dave Brubeck. I'm your host, Howie Kahn. See you next time. Prince Street is brought to you by Dean and DeLuca, purveyors of the finest food since 1977. With over 40 stores around the world, Dean and DeLuca curates the best ingredients for life. That's it from Live from Prince Street. Still hungry? Please subscribe on iTunes or on livefromprincestreet.com.